Uh, hi, Morgan. It looks like we're all here. Are we? Or who are we waiting for at this point? Nope, it looks like we do have representatives from both parties as well as the court reporter. Um, I did want to bring to your attention that Mr. Ellison contacted us regarding um, a table that he wanted to share during his oral argument for through screen share. And mm -hmm. how Zoom is set up is he can share it himself um, if you would like that, or I can handle screen sharing it if you'd prefer. Um, doesn't matter what's easier for you or for him. Whatever is easier is fine with me. Uh, either one is easy, and it looks like Scott Damish got disconnected. Oh, nope, okay. he's back. I can bring them all in now. <laughs> yeah, all right, let's do that, and I'll, we can start. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Morning. And I think our court reporter, uh, Ms. Hankard, are you okay if we start now? Yeah, I am. Hold on. I'm sorry. I got to do my Take video. Your time. I'm well, not going to start just, until, until you tell me. I need to know who Mr. Is it Damage? Scott Damage represents? Yeah, that's actually hit a nail on the head. Thank you. Um, I represent the Michigan Department of Treasury here. The defendant. Okay. And then obviously. I was going to say, you want to guess who I represent? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. So, All just right. as you might know, just in case your record might be unclear, so it just happens the law firm is also the plaintiff. It's, it's one and the same in this, in this unique circumstance, which is becoming less unique, I'm finding these days uh, with the court of claims. So, all right, I am all set, I guess. Hold on, let me get my adjustment here. Get your gear and gear. Yes, exactly. All right, now I am all set. Okay, great. All right, well, let me call the case. Uh, good morning, everyone. This is Court of Claims, case number 22148MZ. It is Outside Legal Counsel, PLC, versus Michigan Department of Treasury. We are here today on defendant's motion for summary disposition in lieu of an answer to the complaint. And let me kind of set the table by telling you what I'm thinking. Um, Mr. Ellison knows I do this all the time in order to kind of speed things up. Maybe I have a little ADHD, I don't know, but um, I, I find it makes it a little bit easier. Um, Mr. Damish, I'm struggling with how I can grant summary disposition in this case. Not that I want to grant summary disposition in any case. I mean, I, you know, do it reluctantly whenever I do it. But uh, in this one, I'm struggling because it seems to me that given the amount of money that's involved, um, Mr. Ellison at least has the right to do some discovery on whether or not the number that you've quoted him is a reasonable number. Why am I wrong about that? Sure, Your Honor. Um, and again, Scott Damage, Assistant Attorney General, appearing on behalf of the defendant here. Um, the, the reason I believe you, you, you might you're wrong on that, Your Honor, respectfully, is that if we look at the at the complaint and the attachments there too, you have enough information to to grant dismissal on the Department of Treasury's favor. Um, Within the reasonable fee, within the estimate, the fee estimate is a breakdown of the fees that are going to be charged, the hourly rates and all of the above. And more importantly, the statute allows for adjustment of those fees after the actual request is complied with. Um, so then it will be able to be more, a little bit more specific on that end once, in fact, Treasury is allowed to process the request once the reasonable fee is paid. Um, in other words, plaintiff will get money back if, in fact, those amounts aren't expended. Um, I also think that you know, in addition to what's been pointed out in the briefing, I think it's important to bring to the, this court's attention to another matter that's um, another court of claims matter called Kemmerer versus Department of Treasury. Um, and that's court of claims number 21-224-MZ. Now, the Kemmerer, Kemmerer matter, sorry, it's a lot of R's and I have a little bit of an impediment with that. Um, 
the Kevin Burr matter, it's a putative class action and it's involving claims for interest on uh, property that has succeeded to the state under our state's unclaimed property act. Um, and whether or not those uh, individuals who reclaim their unclaimed property are entitled to interest. Now, the reason I bring this case up is not for the underlying merits of what's happening with that case, but the procedure of things and specifically discovery. Um, Judge Schwartzel, in that matter, granted a protective order because of um, the broad nature of plaintiff's discovery request for information related to the unclaimed property fund, um, finding that the, the cost would be, and I believe his words were, um, if such discovery would go forward, would not be negligible. Um, I get that that doesn't give us a dollar figure for what's at issue here, but what it does tell us is this is that is just one state fund that issue in that case. If we look at the plain language of plaintiff's um, FOIA request here, they're, he, they're asking for, the law firm is asking for much more than information related to the unclaimed property fund. It's asking for any or all funds. Um, I mean, so this goes well beyond just unclaimed property funds. It could go to prison funds, transportation funds, state brownfield funds, license plate funds, any fund that you could think of that would come through state government. Um, and so when you look at the, the amount that was charged um, by the state agency here, who is, is, uh, is required and mandated to uh, administer this, this portion of FOIA, uh, discretion should be afforded to their reasonable fee estimate. And it's not that, in fact, they'll be, that, that um, plaintiff will be stuck holding the bag with the, the, the paying half of that later on down the road and not getting reimbursement. Um, if in fact the costs are less, that's not the case, they will be reimbursed. It's just that the professionals uh, that are charged with the duties of complying with this request have broken down this the request in a way that would show um, what type of man and woman hours it would take away from their normal operations to respond to such a request. And now we're dealing with financial, with financial information. I mean, that's it's not like we could just print out, um, you know, a, a, a listing of here, here's the funds and here, here's the related information in those funds. The redactions are going to be necessary for personal identifying information, certainly tax information. Um, you have there's a specific statute in the tax world called MCL 205281F that makes it a, a felony um, for Treasury employees to divulge privileged information. Um, in other words, with such a broad request that's made here, on top of already there being a, a pending action regarding only one fund that would be subject to the, the request here, um, I think that, that the court could be in a position to see that in fact, um, the, the fee estimate is, is certainly reasonable. Um, now, that, when Treasury's not saying that they're not going to process this request, it's just the payment will have to be made. Um, and you know whether stuff's exempt or non-exempt, that could be disputed in the future. Um, but the statute specifically allows the state agency here the ability to go and charge a fee estimate if it's going to be, I believe, I, I, if the amount's going to be, I believe, above five hundred dollars a process. Now, I, just based off of what was found in in the Kemmerer matter as a procedural matter, um, I, I think it's it, it's fair to uh, to not just assume, but to to, to come to a finding here. The, the, the fee amount is reasonable given the given the circumstances. The plaintiff's not left without recourse if, if in fact, it's it, it, the fees will be much less. Um, they, you know, in fact, they'll be refunded the money, um, and they only have to pay half of the re, the fee estimate. So, taking into consideration the broad nature of the FOIA request itself, which is attached to the complaint as an exhibit, and the allegations made in the complaint itself, which fail to show, in fact, how Treasury has not complied with the plain language of the FOIA statute here and the discretion afforded to it to set a reasonable fee. Um, we think that this case is ripe for summary disposition under C-8. Now, Your Honor, I certainly understand that you can find yourself in a situation where the statute does give you, a, excuse me, authority to reduce that rate. And you're, you're right now, you're not in a position to do so without a little bit of further information. Um, however, I don't know, I don't believe um, it's going to be the best use of, of our time and your time, Your Honor, to go through more discovery on this matter at this time. Um, again, the professionals charged with the duty to, um, to come up with these reasonable fee estimates have done just that. Um, they have provided a detailed breakdown um, for, for each request made. Um, and once paid, those, pro th those requests will be honored. So I, I think that there's enough now to grant under CA. 
just based off of the allegations of the complaint itself and what's lacking. So let, let me ask you this. If if Mr. Ellison or the plaintiff were to make the deposit, which is roughly five thousand plus dollars, as I understand it, would that then trigger the follow up of determining whether the whole fee was reasonable or how much work was actually necessary. So could that then result in a conclusion that it really isn't close to $11,000, it's closer to 8,000 or whatever it's gonna be. I'm just making up numbers, obviously. Yeah, yeah I think the statute allows, the, statute, the statutory text allows for that. It leads to just that, that conclusion. I mean, it's just uh, the idea of getting half, I don't know why the legislator in the infinite wisdom came with a 50% amount, um, but that was their choice. Uh, but there's also the way to, to, as I say, square up at the end. It's not as if they're going to be left with just that amount uh, that's already been paid. You can't get it back. Um, and if, and I think there could still be a, dis, a you know, I, I think there'd still be an action that could be filed. Um, you know, I, I don't want to tip off opposing counsel on how to go about doing that. But I think within the statute itself will be the areas built in if, in fact, the fees that were charged and assessed are unreasonable after the processing of the thing, they could come back and get. Uh, either if, if their, their fees back if they haven't already um, or other type of remedies. So, that. so uh, Mr. Ellison, what's wrong with the idea that I'm going to, and Mr. Damish, I'll, I'll let you respond to this too, but I want to ask him the plaintiff first. What's wrong with the notion that uh, the court should order that uh, rather than granting summary disposition here, um, that you pay the deposit, the court will retain jurisdiction, the the uh, state will give you after launching its work in um, fulfilling your FOIA request a revised good faith estimate and then you can come back here if that's still troublesome. The short answer is, is that's not how the FOIA statute works. Um, well why can't I order it to work that way? I because, guess that's my question. Because, well, let me, if I, I'd like to be able to present my table, I think would we'll shine some okay. light on this. That, I, I'll be happy to look at your table. Okay. Also file it, file it when you are done. So okay. I have a, I, I yeah. forward it, I forward it over to Angela. I didn't know if we could do this today or not. Um, and apparently I, apparently I have the ability to share. So, um, Looking at your screen, and I'll let me let me zoom that down just a little bit to make sure it's everything's in square. These are the if you take the various FOIA requests that are, and I call them request A and request B, which corresponds to exhibit A and exhibit B into my response that I filed with the court. I'm asking exhibit or uh, request A has essentially four groupings of requests. So the, fir the first one is I'm asking for any documents that shows the rate that the interest that's paid by banks to the state of Michigan. I'm not asking for any bank statements. When I go to the bank and I put and I buy a, a, a CD or I put my money into a bank account and understanding that institutional banks are going to be a little bit different than, you know, Joe every day. They tell me here. They give me a piece of paper that says, this is the rate of interest that we're going to pay you for the money while you hold it into this uh, particular financial account. Okay. So the first bullet point in request A is, is any contracts, notices, communicate documents that confirm the rate of interest, not the amount. Second, the, this, this, the second request is I'm requesting monthly statements from one specific bank, J.P. Morgan Chase. And Mr. Uh, Mr. Damage is correct. This is tied to an underlying case that I'm working on um, as part of all of this. That's been stayed now for eight months that I can't get Judge Schwartzel to turn the case back on because of an ap application for leave that they took after the Judge Schwartzel ruled in my favor in part on uh, a C-8 motion. So... I'm asking for three years of information from J.P. Morgan Chase uh, of bank statements effectively, and also bank statements for three years from other financial institutions. What the state has done is they've gone back and said, we're just going to give you all, we're, as part of this estimate, we're going to give you every piece of paper that we've gotten from the state, from these banks, as to the state of Michigan for these accounts for seven years. 
That's not what I asked for. Now, the reason why I think they've taken an over generous view on this is so that they can create what I call in, in this, and, and some courts have called this in the past, a constructive denial. Now, fairness, that is not a cause of action. A constructive denial is not a, a recognized cause of action, but it is a label we give these types of cases where the state um, has decided to be um, kind of the old, it's kind of like what I was thinking about with the, um, oh, there was that Gene Hackman movie where he was a litigator, where he was fighting about the blinker with the car. And they said, give us everything you've got. And they, and we, we we're only looking for one specific document that we're looking for. And of course they sent him three truckloads of, of documents that are in the boxes, right. That are, that are there. I'm looking for the rate of interest that the state of Michigan obtains in this respect. And of course, the fourth bullet point in all this is, is I'm looking for the FOIA or the emails about them processing. And essentially, that's been my kind of cute way to make sure that, that I'm getting a good faith attempt to get these things fulfilled. What the state has done here is they have overly identified documents. And they've done this to me before, where they overextend and over-identify to increase the cost of that response so that the idea when they come to a judge and, I, and, and when I challenge these things and they'll say, well, just pay the fee in this respect. That's the whole point. A fee of that amount is a constructive barrier because I don't want to pay $5,000 for those records. What I would like to be able to get is access to the rate of income and interest that's there. Now, from FOIA, and this is where you were just at. Now, this ties me back in before I go into request B. This ties me back into your question is why is it unreasonable for you to request to order me to pay the full amount that they've requested in that respect? Because the reason being is in most of the time when you do a FOIA case, a requester makes a request, or excuse me, a request, and the state is supposed to respond by each separate request and say, this is the amount of money that it's going to take. Because I don't know how many records there are for each of these. And in that instance, the requester can then decide whether or not they wish to proceed on paying the specific deposit. Now, in this respect, um, what I believe is bullet number one should be one document or maybe, maybe a small number of documents, a handful of them. But they're not doing that. They're giving me seven years of everything that ever was delivered by that bank. And that's what they're, and what the court does not have before it is the state's uh, response to some discovery that was done after the motions were fully briefed before you, which establishes all of this. They want to produce almost, uh, by my estimates, about 7,000 pages of documents is the response that they want to give to this request. That is way beyond the scope of what this is here. So one of the things I would like to be able to establish with discovery, and I don't think it'll take very much work to do, would be is to go to the actual person, and I forgive me, I was going to write his name down. I forgot this morning. He was with the Treasury Department. He's the guy that puts the tables together, put the Excel spreadsheets together on this, and say to him, if walk him through this particular thing, I just walked to you and say, if I get three years of statements, of bank statements, which we'll talk about that in a second, and the rate of interest, what would that cost to produce it? I suspect it would be in the tens of dollars, not thousands of dollars in this respect. And the reason, and I, and I don't want to allege bad faith judge, but on that vein, I think the reason why the state did this is because they're not having a very good time in the Kemmer case right now. And they don't want to hand over this information while this case is stayed. So I can continue to work on this materials while we wait for the Michigan court of appeals um, to decide whether to grant an application or not in that particular case. So I know I took kind of the long way around the barn, which you know we always do when we talk, when we, you and I get together and we talk about cases like this. What I should be able to permit, permitted to do is to go in and say, you are purposely over, what I call over-identifying documents, over-defining documents for the means of actually increasing the cost to create the constructive barrier. So um, in addition to all of this, my brother counsel has cited continues to cite that there's somehow some sort of taxpayer information. I'm not seeking taxpayer information. What I'm seeking is, is there, there's nothing in there that is, gives anything to anybody involving um, 
monies that way, meaning individual taxpayers in this respect. I'm seeking the bank statement. I mean, I, I got a I get a bank statement every month from my bank that just simply says, here's your deposits, here's your withdrawals on that respect. And if the request to fulfill that, for example, um, maybe I want to just buy because it's too expensive to buy the other financial institutions, the third bullet point for those three years, I can say to the state, I want to narrow the scope of my request. I want to narrow the number of years of the request. Or if it's cheaper, the other way is, is they could ex I could expand the scope of the request by actually making further requests in that respect. And I'm going to finish my kind of long diatribe here by saying the problem that I run into and as, as, as both a lawyer in FOIA cases and as a FOIA requester myself is, I don't know how many documents are actually responsive to the request because I'm seeking records that the state holds that I have no independent verifiable way to understand what exactly it is they're doing as the basis for their cost calculations. And unfortunately, so, I'm in exactly the same boat, aren't I? You are. And that's what, but that's why we have, that's why when a person like myself believes and wants to take the extra step to challenge the state's assessment of their fees, Section 10A gives me that tool as a requester to be able to go in to make that request instead of coming back right now that says, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not poking at Mr. Damage specifically. We ha we've had some nice conversations, but he's saying, trust us, we're the government. And I'm sorry, that just doesn't su suffice as a basis going forward. And what he's trying to ask you to do is, is continue that constructive barrier wall by making it so prohibitively expensive $5,000 for something I don't even know if it's going to be responsive to my request. Judge, I would probably have to decline to even do it at that kind of rate for, for documents. At least what I can do now is with a simple half hour deposition with uh, the, rec the custodian of records, I can I think I can pretty well establish that they are over identifying and this case can be resolved on much narrower grounds. What I, I guess that's where I lead you to as is, 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 I think some trickery is going on here and I don't mean it in terribly bad faith and I don't mean it. I don't mean, I mean, it does have that stink to it, but, but I think what is what's established here is that treasury is trying to hide and, and Mr. Damage has identified the reason for their, for this particular aspect is, is the underlying Kemmer case that they don't want that information to become publicly accessible to someone like me. Okay. Well, you can take the document down and let me say a couple yep. things. First of all, I am, um, confident that Mr. Damish is here in good faith. And I, I'm confident of that for a, for a reason maybe you don't know, and nobody knows except Mr. Damish and me, and that is that he's argued in front of me a few times in the Court of Appeals. And I think he's heard me say that, A, I hate tax. Mm -hmm. I never took tax. I've never in the 68 years of my life, never done my own taxes. And he always manages to explain the tax issues quite clearly either, so that even a dum-dum, i.e. me, can understand them. So there's no thought in my mind that Mr. Damish is being, uh, is, is acting in anything good other than good faith. He's one of the lawyers who I enjoy sort of, even though it's tax, seeing in the court of appeals. So that, that issue is is a non-starter for me. Just and so Judge, I, I don't mean to interrupt. I, I don't mean to disparage him in any way in this. And I hope the court knows, knows me. Uh, yeah, well I know, know, I know. But, 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 but there, we're at war. I mean, there is an I adversarial know. process at play and we're at war about access to a very, very big case that will potentially embarrass the Department of Treasury and his clients have an interest in making sure that doesn't come out that way. So I'm now confused about why this case wasn't assigned to D Judge Schwartzel. Not that, it, I mean, it's too late for me to get rid of it now, but uh, it seems to me it should have been a companion case to the other one. Because it's different plaintiffs. Yeah. That's, um, I mean, that's the short of it, right? And okay. um, and the that was a discovery dispute. This is a FOIA dispute. And, and I can go through the case law, but those are no, two no, totally no. different tracks that don't, oh, those, oh, those are independent of each other under the law. So All right. well, it's too late now anyway. So, um, but, but Mr. Damish, I, I mean, as much as I think you always operate in good faith, and I do, um, how do I know whether this estimate is reasonable 
sure. other than to give Mr. Ellison at least a shot at some discovery. Sure. Before I begin, Judge Gleiser, thank you for your kind words. I really appreciate that. And, and I, I think I have some good news. Even though I'm representing Treasury in this matter, I transferred out, out of the Revenue and Tax Division to the State Operations oh. Division. So I have I have no longer going to be the tax person. Um, I, I don't think that's good news. I mean, who's going to be the tax person? <laughs> you better make sure they know how to talk to them. They do. I, I give spent, them a I, tutorial. I spent four years managing over there, three almost four years managing, and I got to tell you, there's some, there's some, there's some, there's some good, good litigators over there right now that will explain things even better than I ever have. So well, um, I hope you're right about that. I'll let you you know if you're not hey, don't hold it don't hold it against me if they don't right i'm not I've, i haven't been managing them for about like six or seven months now um okay. but where i want to start here is with the question you asked like well why not just dismiss why not just have uh you know order the compliance with with the with, with the FOIA request here what i suggest is this perhaps dismiss with prejudice and have um, mr ellison submit the exhibit that he produced today 15 minutes before hearing as his actual FOIA request if you look at Exhibit A, Your Honor, that's the actual request made to the Department of Treasury. And that request includes much more broad language than Mr. Ellison has led you to believe. And more importantly, I, br I brought up the Kemmerer matter just to show that one fund that would be subject to his dispute created Judge Schwartz's concern to issue an order staying discovery in that matter. The, the word Kemmerer doesn't appear anywhere in his in his FOIA request. It's the, the plain language of his FOIA request includes things like um, you know, it, 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 interest income paid or to be paid to the state of Michigan or its Department of Treasury by any financial institution regarding balances of any funds held at the respective financial institutions from 2015 to present. So what was placed on the screen there and produced to myself 10 minutes before an oral argument today is not the accurate depiction of the request that Mr. Ellison submitted to my client here. Um, so I, 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 I ask this, Your Honor, to please line up um, the exhibit that Mr. Ellison proposed today to the actual exhibit A, the actual FOIA request that was submitted to my client. Um, and you will see why it would result in the amount of documents that Mr. Ellison said thousands because of the use of expansive language, like any, all, any or all funds. That's what was presented to the state agency here. So they can't be demonized for complying with the plain language of the actual request submitted. So perhaps the proper route would be to dismiss, but without prejudice, but give Mr. Ellison the opportunity to, to submit maybe a more pointed, a more pointed FOIA request. Um, and, and because that's not what it was actually submitted to the, the Department of Treasury here. And I urge this court to not use that exhibit as what is at dispute here. Exhibit A is uh, to the complaint is the actual FOIA request. Okay, um, well, just let me just say I would not dismiss with prejudice, but I would certainly without, consider without. dismissing without prejudice. Correct. And I would also consider just not dismissing it at all, but just delaying uh a ruling um on summary disposition until and if mr ellison is willing to allow treasury to file an amended response to an amended foia request that basically is goes or just echoes the one the, the exhibit that you put in front of the court this morning if the if you're looking to me yes i am yes okay I would be willing to do that, but okay. I would like the treasury not to take a month to do it. I would need a quicker, I mean, I don't want them to take the 10 day extension and drag this thing out for months at a time. If they could turn around this within, I'll submit it today. In fact, to Mr. Damage, if he could turn around within seven or 14 days and have, I, I just don't want this to drag out because judge, I've already had to wait. And, and, and again, I know you're a busy lady and I, we've talked about this in the past with the Hamad case, but I've already had to wait five months just to get a hearing in front of you on a C8 motion that has an affidavit attached to it improperly, right? So if we're going to do this- Is that a mod this, or is like, that another one? Is that a mod or is that another one? Uh, well, I'm just, mod. well, mod's been six years in the making and God yeah, but knows- that, I know that's not, that one's not my fault, but okay. But fair, but enough, like, fair enough. I'm just saying it, just, right. it takes a lot of time to get us teed up. And what I don't want this to turn into is, is, is more delay 
to for the sake of delay. So if okay. if I could get a represent, I'm I'm willing to on that because what I'm hearing is a proposal. If the proposal is to submit that FOIA I, as, a, as a separate FOIA, I don't think it's any different. I, I, sh I shorten the language for clarity today, but I didn't rewrite anything. Those are the same request. But if Mr. Damage thinks that that somehow narrows the scope of this request to be able to get down to respond to it, I just want the records. Your, Your Honor, if I could respond quickly. It, what I would request is, is this, that if you dismiss without prejudice, and that Mr. Ellison file a FOIA request through the proper avenues, not through me, to the state agency, and he can exercise the statutory rights afforded to him under the statute to then get the matter back in front of this court. Um, I'm not, well, be clear, I'm not going to stipulate to a dismissal of anything. It's not, I'm not going to stipulate to that at all. But I would, but, 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 that, but it ha having some type of supervisory control over this, if this type of process is statutorily established already, I think dismissing this matter right now without prejudice and allowing Mr. Ellison to then submit to Treasury to fulfill its obligations to respond to a more narrowed discovery, a more narrowed uh, request here would be uh, would be the proper route. Um, I, 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 I would, well, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. But why, why won't you? I mean, that seems like a reasonable, it, you'll come back to me. I mean, there's no reason it won't come back to me. Because so I'll already know the facts. I mean, I don't mean to be flippant about I've had to wait months to get back to where I think Treasury is over identifying. But and on top of it, who's going to pay my hundred seventy five dollar filing fee? Right. Well, there's, that would be a cost that they, that's recoverable. There's that's built. It, not if it's a, excuse me, not if it's dismissed. If it's dismissed, there's no cost recovery then. It's it built because into it's the statute. Is built into the statutes the ability to recover costs associated with FOIA requests. It, but this would be a new FOIA request, though. That's the point that you just said. It's a new FOIA request. It would be much more pointed than the one you you you've already submitted. I'm asking, I guess, Judge. I I will. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to submit the request either way right now, um, just as a matter of going forward. And if that independently, separately between Mr. Damage and I resolves this case and gives me the records that I'm looking for, I'll voluntarily dismiss this case. Okay. So but how? What, so. But I'm asking ask this court emphatically not to dismiss this case because I think. That the that the 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 response from Treasury was improperly done, and I'd like the opportunity to be able to challenge those cost assessments under Section 10. So what I would suggest would be is, I liked your other one that you suggested, which is let's delay a short time for Treasury to respond to the FOIA request. And I mean, if they take another 21 days, to I mean, I'm going to view that negatively, and 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 you know maybe the court will or won't. I will view it negatively. But um, I will make that same request to Treasury and CC a copy of you on that. And if that resolves it, great. Then I'll voluntarily dismiss because I'll have the records that I'm looking for. Okay, let me, ask, let me ask Mr. Damage, how, how much, or Mr. Ellison, I don't, either one of you, remind me, how much time, if you submit the request, how much time does Treasury have? I don't remember the statute that well. Effectively, if they take the extension a month. They get, okay. they and get you're five willing business to get... days plus right. okay. 10 more business days, which is effectively a month. Your Honor, I don't. I, I, I would. I, I would suggest that we don't turn yourself and myself into FOIA coordinators. There's already a. There's already a statutory process set up. I. I, I cannot accept a FOIA request on behalf of Treasury. I'm not authorized to do so. So I will not stipulate to that. Uh, it, 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 it just, if, if Mr. Ellison sub resubmits a a more pointed FOIA request and withdraws the current one that he has, that would clean things up. I mean, if, he, if he's telling us, he's flashed on the screen today what he's looking for. If that's not what he's looking for anymore, I, we don't know. If it's, if it's the broad nature of his original request, then I still think that it should be dismissed for the reasons we stated in our briefing. Um, it, it, it's, and here's the thing, even if, we dis, even if we go ahead and resubmit the four requests, there's still the possibility that Mr. Ellison is going to challenge what's exempt versus non-exempt material. So we're just kicking the can down the road. But if we do a fresh restart here with a more pointed request, there's going to be less battle going on in, in this hypothetical war that Mr. Ellison is talking about. But I I should, you're the one that created the battle. And I say you, your client is the one that created the battle from my allegations in charging an unlawful fee. That's my allegation that you're creating an unlawful fee. And what I need to establish is, is how did you come out to that fee? The judge doesn't have that info, and I barely have that information about why it would take what it looks like the functional equivalent of a month's work of staff time to make copies of some bank statements. You are now, maybe I'm wrong, and I can't make my proofs to the judge, 
but I think I should at least have the opportunity to make that up, you know, at least by having understanding how those numbers were calculated rather than simply taking it at wink, wink, good faith of the government official that did so, who is already in the midst of an underlying litigation and has an interest to stonewall that information. I think it's so that's my position. And I'm not going to judge. I'm not going to argue any further, but I am not going to voluntarily dismiss or voluntarily amend my complaint or amend my FOIA. I will, however, as a means to help try to resolve this case, I will submit a second FOIA. Um, um, and in fact, I may even do it with uh, some under someone else's name to be able just to keep it separate and distinct that way. Um, and the Treasury can decide how they want to deal with that in their due course. Your Honor, having two separate FOIA requests out there is not going to result in better judicial economy. It's not. Um, it, 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 it's Mr. Ellis's prerogative to go ahead and resubmit a FOIA request. But, but before this court is, 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 is the Department of Treasury's motion to dismiss the current matter for the current request made. And as far as how the costs were break, broken down, exhibit E to the complaint goes through each of the hourly, the hourly amounts and in the amounts of the lowest paid employee, the lowest of the lowest you could pay an employee of that status to do to do the actual work. And that's what's required by statute. It doesn't have to say we it takes 10 it takes an hour to look through 15 pages that's not required by statute so it, it, what mr ellison is asking here is 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 special treatment uh, is the what department of treasury is supposed to do in response to a foia but and there's no and there's no the indication truth. that treasury is stonewalling because of ongoing litigation again kemmerer is not mentioned even in his foia request um, it, it, they, Treasury said they'd be willing to process the request if you pay the amount. And in fact, in Exhibit E, they broke down the cost for each of the separate requests. There's nothing stopping Mr. Ellison from paying, say, the $750 associated with one of the requests for one of the financial institutions and have Treasury process that request. He could very well do that. But, with, but again, what's before this court today is the reasonableness of the fee estimate. And I believe that you have enough information in front of you right now, Your Honor, based off of the allegations of the complaint and the requirements, the lack thereof of certain other things, of, of other violations purportedly of the statute that don't exist, um, to be able to dismiss this case. And there would be nothing that would preclude Mr. Ellison from then submitting a more pointed FOIA request. But what would be what I would be hard pressed to agree with is having two separate FOIA requests where I'm turned into now a FOIA coordinator to process this along. And, and kind of have supervisory authority over a second FOIA request. Um, it's, I think it needs to be one or the other. It's either we, we litigate this current FOIA request that was submitted on July 10th, or we litigate the perhaps the next one that's going to come along, or maybe we don't have to based off of what Treasury's response is. Um, I, 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 would, I don't think we should have dual FOIA requests going on at the same time. Um, if, if we would could just keep the focus on what has been alleged in this complaint, what has been attached to this complaint, I, again, I brought Kemmerer up just to show that just for one fund, um, just for one fund, again, he asked for information on any funds and all funds, just for one fund, Judge Schwartzel found the cost of the state would not be negligible. It, he didn't give a dollar amount. But again, this is a, 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 a state agency who is afforded discretion when, when, when making decisions like this for fee estimates. They are not stonewalling and there's no indication of that. And it's improper for Mr. Ellison to say that without any proof. So I would ask that your honor, just please rule on the current motion and, and dismiss this case uh, with without prejudice under C8 and allow Mr. Ellison to perhaps amend his FOIA request if he so pleases. Um, but I, I, would, I would ask that this court not order this case stayed pending the, the the payment of the fee here and then waiting and then as we go further down the line find that there's exempt versus non-exempt fights that are going to go on let's let the, if, if that's going to happen let's let that evolve at the state agency level and it, regarding timing of it all again there are there's built in the statute the ability to get fees and costs associated with um it, there's a lot of teeth in the statute against the state agencies when they don't comply with the FOIA statute just here treasury has fully complied with it and especially with the broad nature of the request made here. Um, so, you know, for those reasons, I, I ask that you, you dismiss this case on, under C8. I believe you have enough information to do so. Um, and and I, I would ask that we not have dual FOIA requests going on at the same time where we're turning yourself and myself into FOIA coordinators. Uh, okay, I think I have enough 
information. Um, thank you both. The court is not an easy case, but I'll think about it and uh, hopefully get Judge, you a I response make, soon. I was trying to be respectful because I, I disagree with Mr. Damage, but one I'd like to correct one thing for sure he just said. Okay. He just said that the, 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 the Treasury has discretion to decide what fee to charge, and that's not true. Section four. Okay, he of the... knows. I mean, I, I understood what he said. Okay. He all knows right. that Thank it you. has to be a reasonable fee. I know that too. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you both. Thank you, Judge. Nice seeing you, Judge. Have a great day. You too. Bye.